The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to the Bronx Opera on BronxNet. I'm Ben Spearman, Bronx Opera's General Director. You're about to watch a performance from our 2014-2015 season of Benjamin Britten's brilliant British comedy, Albert Herring. Based upon a novella by Guy de Maupassant, the apprentice Eric Crozier moved the action from small town France to small town England. Albert Herring tells the story of the town mothers and fathers of Loxford, an imaginary English town, and their search to find a virtuous young woman to serve as Queen of the May, a symbol for their May Day festival. After rejecting all of the girls in town for various reasons, the town leaders hit upon a novel solution, a May King, the virtuous, shy, seemingly simple grocer's son, Albert Herring. As you can well imagine, things don't go quite as planned, as Albert's experiences are broadened thanks to his friends Sid and Nancy and a bit of Spike to punch. This production was directed by Rod Gomez, with scenery by Meg Ann George, costumes by Peter Fogel, lighting by Joshua Rose, it was stage managed by John P. Hunter, and production managed by Scott H. Schneider. This performance of this 1947 opera was conducted by Michael Spearman and featured Leslie Swanson, Julie Devere, Danielle Buonaiuto, Andrew Oakton, Joseph Michael Brent, C. David Morrow, Stanley Lacey, Amy Maud Helfer, Helena Brown, Hannah First, Christina Sargashel, Eric Ackerman, and, as Albert, Chad Cranick. I'll be back at intermission with a conversation I had with Rod Gomez, in which we'll talk about Rod's journey to directing and about his approach to this particular opera. But now we take you to Lehman College's Lovinger Theater for our January 11th, 2015 performance of Albert Herring. Enjoy.
Lost in touch illegitimates. Advert in chemist's window, indecent. Tear it up. Call it Pinrose Cottage. Must up William making such rude noises or else. Buy a breakfast cup. Load of logs for number six, the mount. It is for Mr. Pilgrim. Did they count how many from the orbs has wanted copies of the mission soon? No more copies in all to lose it. Not too wrong in little buskers were more. Make responses quicker. Sit here, Miss Wordsworth. Let me stand until we're ready to begin. As you will. <laughs> Ten seconds fast, I make that. No, you're slow. Exactly right, my mind. Oh, I find it so refreshing to escape from school a sunny day like this. Plain truant. Funny being slow. Never known it. Mr. Gedge, once oiling, I expect dust in the works. Quite perfect, Mr. Mayor. Promises a splendid May and June. In like a lion, out like a lamb. That was true of March this year. It was. Song, you know. Well, since we're here, her ladyship was very distressed when she heard about Curtis's daughter. Uh, oh, tell me that's her third. She won't confess the father, silly girl. It's happening far too often. Lady Jarvis is another problem. Twins, if you please. Drunk and father, mother of slattern. These things breed immorality oh, in the young. One thing must be done. Oh, yeah, yeah. stand now before the evil spreads. Though she exaggerates occasionally. Strong measures are essential now. Of course they are. Yeah, yeah. This festival idea yeah, yeah. I have. I am all to Hush! She's here. Careful now. Oh, her ladyship. Here she comes. 
The first suggestion on my list is a charming local girl who takes communion and never missed a Sunday, Jennifer Searles. Had an affair with young Tom O'Dear last Christmas. He's dismissed. <laughs> of all the pupils from the school, it gives me particular pleasure to recommend Elizabeth Newell, whose botany notes are a treasure. Was seen in the woods after dark with Tom Hood last Thank <laughs> you. 
In your pardon, I'd like to say, has anyone heard of a king of the May? King of the May? Oh, oh the gracious! I never did! Not any Suffolk, I suppose you'd crown Sid. <laughs> Maybe it seems a rum sort of notion, but it might help us out of the present commotion. Oh, it may be helpful. No. Mere red herring, bud. Just so. Herring's the name and herring's the lad. Fellow, where wanting's there to be had. Albert Herring. Works for his mother, has a greengrocer's shop. Strong as a horse, works till he drops. Simple, of course, but we won't find another. Albert Herring's clean as new mown hay, honest, truthful, keen as common mustard, as they say. Never clicks up rough as most boys do, but real good stuff. As good as gold, right through and through. <laughs> I know the boy you mean, but is he quite? I've seen him since he was a kid. He's always lived next door to me. When he attended school, poor Albert was not bright at lessons. The most exceptional for conduct. An inoffensive lad, simple of course. A splendid son to Mrs. Herring. What precisely has a grocer's lad to do with this discussion? Ridiculous proposal. I'm 
certain there are girls, farmers' daughters, maybe suitable for us.
out. We'll help you up. Got young Harry pinching things. How do you carry a weight like that alone? Corn must be twenty stone or more. It's a hundred weight of turnips. I see. Strong man at. Shall I have three boxes of mixed herbs, please, Chum? Yes. Got any sage? We've some at threepence a box. Same as the mix. I'll take three then. That makes six boxes at three pence. One and a kick. That's right. Toss you double or quits. Oh no, Sid. Gambling's not in my line. Mum wouldn't like it. Never you mind. Heads or tails. Come on, you call. No, really I won't. Thanks all the same. But why? Because of Mum. Won't she let you have any fun? Did you ever have a pint at the local? Mom's teetotal. Don't go out with a whip it after rabbits. Strict in her habits. Did you ever try taking a girl? Ooh, a stop this talk. Or dance with the band at the Jubilee Hall. I don't like it or at dance all. With the band. I just don't like it at or all. Dance with the band at the Jubilee Hall. Not at all. Once you broke the apron strings, tickling a trout, poaching a hare, flying wild geese is pretty good sport for a chap to enjoy. Living without a regular share of pleasures like this is hard to support for your kind of a boy. But courting a girl is a king of all sports in a class of its own. With her aunt in the rule so long as she's caught and you can't her alone. Girls me.
lot to do. Oh, don't you worry, I'm just off. I'm busy too. Good morning, you two. Why, look who's here. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> You've just come in time. We were talking of you. Talking of me. You have got a sauce. It was Albert who started the subject, of course. You want to watch Albert? He's a very dark horse. You ought to have something better to do than gossiping here. Aren't you working today? I've been spinning around like a humming top since I opened the shop at 8 o'clock. And you know what they say about work and no play. Well, come and save me. I'm in a hurry. I've come for a piece of a best English beef. There's no need to worry. There's no need to worry. Have a nice peach. Oh, Mary. Those are sixpence each. <laughs> Stand the damage. Two peaches at sixpence. That's a shilling, please. I think I can just about manage to squeeze out a bob from the firm's petty cash. I won't eat them now. They're so ripe, they might splash. You can bring them tonight, and we'll each take a bite to flavor our kids. With a dash of peach bitters. That sounds just delicious. Meet me at quarter past eight in the street. Don't be late or I'll whistle under your window. Yes, if you promise to wait in the street if I'm late and not whistle. Much less to care. 
and tidy up the stock, enthusiastically fix price labels around the shop. For what? It's not very thrilling to live among boxes and baskets of vegetables, flowers, and seasonal fruits. I'm expert at a job like weighing a punnets of raspberries and knowing when root crops are likely to shoot. For what? For what? For what? It seems as clear as clear can be that its ideas are very much too crude for mother to approve. And yet I'd really like to try that kind of love. your basket? Haven't got one. Bust it. My sister went and lost it. I'll pour down in paper. Ta! That'll be safe for the taking of loose. No school today. Not extra holidays. Whatever for. On account of Miss Weaver, our botany teacher, went camping at Easter, got scarlet fever. She was sharing our tent when she came on us bodies, so they sent us all home with a letter explaining they wouldn't expect us at school for a week in case we're in French. <laughs> Tuppets, please. Here you are. Don't mind farthings, do you? Thanks, mister.
want me? Yes, you do. Oh, oh, but oh, oh, oh. Welcome back to the Bronx Opera on BronxNet and tonight's presentation of Britain's Albert Herring. I'm here with our director, Rod Gomez, and to talk a little bit about Rod's history and how Rod got into directing and about the production that you're in the middle of watching. Um, first of all, hi, Rod. How are you? Good. How are you, Ben? I'm Good well. 
I'm well, we're doing this just as things are pointing towards opening back up um, in early June, mid June after the pandemic. So I think that we as, as directors are both looking forward to getting back into what we do, which is work with performers in, in a room towards presenting something on stage. Um, yes. So first of all, I wanted to ask you um, just a little bit about your background, because people ask, people ask me, like, how did you, how do you get into directing? What is it that brings you from whatever you did before? Because most people that aren't born as directors, you, you sort of become one. So how, what was the process like for you? How did that come about for you? Well, uh, primarily, uh, I spent most of my adulthood as a singer, a baritone singing with a ton of roles, uh, most of the standard baritone rep. Um, but people had always told me they thought I saw, um, all my directors told me that they thought I saw each show like a director and I might look into it. And eventually it took hold. And by the time I was finishing grad school, um, I approached the director of the program and asked her if she wanted an assistant. I was singing Marcello in La Buena at the, at the time in the San Francisco Conservatory. And this is uh, Willine Gunn, who uh, was the director at Sacramento Opera and the Eugene Opera and you know, a lot of regional houses out, out west. Um, and uh, she took me on as her assistant. Uh, and that was it. That basically just kind of propelled me. Once people uh, got wind of the fact that I was doing some stage directing, mm -hmm. they just kind of inquired and you know, things took off from there. You know, I will say that uh, I started out as a singer in college, but before that I did, you know, I, like a lot of young people, I took acting first and was doing musical theater before I actually got into classical singing. So while I was doing all that stuff, I did, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, I had always saw the world through this kind of film lens, I suppose, you know, as a, as a director. And I had always been going from the time I was in high school, just going to the matinees and uh, revival houses, seeing all this classic stuff in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So, I mean, I suppose it's not a, a surprise that, uh, that I came to directing uh, later in life as, uh, as, uh, as an offshoot, as the singer. And, and is, was, would you say that the singing was what got you into particularly being interested in directing opera? Yeah, I would say so. Just because some, from the simple uh, aspect of just exposure to uh, the great music, you know, what's, what's I think the unique thing about singing opera uh, is being exposed to the kind of complexity of, uh, of the music. And mm -hmm. then once you kind of are able to get into the skin of that, you realize that, you know, sometimes what you, how you'd like to see uh, a certain uh, work be, be manifest on the stage. So uh, I had, you know, the, the ideas were always kind of uh, in there somewhere. And I know you've, you, you, you do and have done a fair amount of uh, theater, theatrical directing, I will we'll call it non-musical theater. Um, what would you say the differences are as a director between the non-musical and the you know musical operatic style of direction for you, if any? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. The um, uh, I direct a lot at Hofstra University, and we always have after the closing of a show a symposium, uh, and th they always ask this question. And um, the one thing I will say, like any, I think music musical production, uh, musical theater, uh, maybe ballet that has underscored music, whatever kind of dramatic uh, intentions there are, uh, the dramatic arcs or dramatic beats of an actor uh, that occur uh, are kind of prescribed to you in opera because you have a limited time. You have, you know, 16 measures of 4-4. Uh, and then from that place you have, uh, somebody dying and having to uh, be discovered. Uh, and so when you have uh, a straight theatrical production without music, you can use that 
uh, time however you want. And you can stretch mm -hmm. it out or you can condense it or you can overlap it without really concerns about uh, how to actually fill the actual music as it were. So opera sort of, opera dictates to the director in a way that without the musical aspect in terms of timing, in a way that you're not dictated to in, when you're not working in music as well. Yeah, I would say so. Um, th and that's always a negotiation. I mean, mm -hmm. you, as, as a director, I'm sure you, you come across this too. So you're constantly juggling, you know, the, the ideas that you want to see happen on stage, uh, juxtaposed with the musical ideas. Uh, and, they, and they often intersect, but sometimes, you know, you're trying to massage or coordinate how they actually can intersect. Um, you, you just don't have, you aren't, those dictates aren't prescribed to you in straight theatrical productions. So, um, right. yeah, that is, uh, that, that's an advantage for a director, I would say, uh, not having to uh, be so uh, bound by those. So you will, we'll be watching a bunch of, a, a few Bronx opera productions that you directed and um, some are of more serious operas and some are like the console, which we'll also talk about at a different time and Cinderella and things like that. The, talk a little bit about Albert Herring and particularly what attracted you to it and also what attracts you to the works of the composer of Albert Herring, who's really, I don't I think it's safe to say he's probably the most prominent 20th century opera composer. I think that's probably fair, the British composer, Benjamin Britten. So just talk a little bit, if you would, about Herring in particular and Britain in general. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that assessment. He, um, let me see, I've sung a number of his works uh, and I always was, when I first was uh, exposed to Britain, I, I didn't really quite know what to make of it because a lot <laughs> I of I think nobody singers. does. I think everybody who goes to Britain spends a, a, a certain amount of time going, what? What is this? Yeah, what the colors this? are so different. I mean, especially yeah. if, we, if we, you know, we all grew up on Mozart and Puccini and Verdi and Donizetti. Uh, so, uh, but it's looking at at the same world with just with different colors and different techniques. Mm. So uh, it's really, it was wonderful. I think once I got my mind around that, uh, I just wanted to explore more and more of it. I had sung a number of uh, his works uh, before I started directing. And uh, I'd sung like Billy Budd and I'd sung uh, Noah uh, and a few of his other things, Not a War Requiem. And just... I want to just break in for a second and say that for those who don't know, Britain wrote these very large scale, really grand operas like Billy Budd, which Rod just mentioned, and Peter Grimes, which is probably his, certainly his large scale masterpiece and one of my personal favorites, which is Gloriana, which are very large scale works. Um, and then he wrote, he wrote these church parables, which Rod just mentioned, one of them, which is uh, Noah's Flood. Um, and then he's got these, these particularly smaller chamber operas, like the, the Turn of the Screw and The Rape of Lucretia and, and Herring. And having sung in Billy Budd and then directing Herring, what would you say the differences are in his language and how that affects the director's work from the large scale to the smaller scale chamber piece? Oh, I think... Uh... It's, it's to, I think it's to the director's advantage because the chamber piece, you really can distill a lot more meaning of the text and a lot more uh, clarity of, of, the, of, the, of the drama itself. Um, I think in the larger pieces like Rhymes and uh, Billy Budd, there's so much bombast and so much uh, spread. So it's so epic in scale the attention of the audience member, who, or whoever, whomever is uh, just kind of partaking of the thing. It's, it's, uh, you're thinking about so many things, uh, you know, the ships, the, 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 the... There's a lot going on. There's so much more. Going I mean, Grimes on. is such a huge chorus opera too, and so many things are going on within the chorus that obviously yeah. are not an issue in Harry. Yeah, I directed Grimes, I think right before, Mm. was my first Britain thing of all things. I mean, it was a yeah. kind of semi-stage thing mm. uh, and it's fantastic. And yeah, um, yeah so I, uh, I think uh, Michael, your father had uh, 
I think this was my second time I was directing a Bronx. I think, I think, yeah, the, I think I, Tra- La Traviata, I think Traviata was, was first. first. Yeah. 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 So he, uh, you know, he threw out some ideas and I thought, well, you know, we had just done a large kind of romantic straightforward thing, Verdi kind of war horse. So let's go the other way. Let's do comedy chamber, small. So I was thinking along those lines. And, uh, so I thought uh, this, this would be great. Uh, I'd always wanted to do Harry. Uh, I'd seen it uh, a number of times and I, uh, I'd always been curious about it. So um, yeah, so I just thought this would be a really terrific opportunity to try it. And what did you, what did you, tell me if you can about your experience with it in terms of what you, what you enjoyed, if there's anything that, cha- that was challenging. Oh you know, yeah, sure. To you. Um, I think this was uh, this was among my most. I think maybe with the console, this was probably my favorite attempts to like put something on stage with Bronx Opera because it it really lends itself to um, you know uh, not a huge set, mm-hmm. not a huge. You don't feel like you're missing anything as an audience member, as, a, as somebody who's uh, uh, seeing the show. Uh, because because of what I was saying, um, you know, the if if you see the show as I did, as maybe Albert's awakening, growth, mm-hmm. blooming into the world, told through a lens of this kind of small-minded village parochial mentality, uh, you can kind of just focus on that without needing. Uh, so many kind of extraneous uh, elements and without feeling like you're missing anything. So uh, I really wanted to just focus on that as, as we told the story. Uh, and uh, I really I, I love the process that we had there in the Bronx. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a really um, successful production. And I felt like scenically it was very, it was kind of stark. It was, it was kind of a, a lot of a black and white feel to it almost. And the designer was uh, someone you and I both enjoyed working with a lot who unfortunately passed, Megan George. Um, yeah. And let's talk a little bit for a second just about the collaboration with Megan in terms of director designer and how that worked for you. Sure, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I loved working with Megan. Uh, when, when I first uh, knew we were going to be doing Herring and when I first knew it, again we had conversations and I said well let's uh let's push it a little further back than how you know uh, a little closer to contemporary than where it actually is so let's think Edwardian maybe instead of Victorian uh still keep it in England I said for just for scenic palettes think of like Edward Gorey uh black and white very two-dimensional uh because that's kind of how I wanted to represent uh yeah. It's kind of, you know, small mindedness. Uh, and then we just played with various ideas uh, of how to kind of represent the other things on, on that are happening on stage. Uh, yeah. Um, just to, to close up, I just wanted to, I wanted to talk for a second about coming out of the pandemic and, you know, what, what your experience was of the pandemic as a, in, a position that I understand well, which is as a director, you know, where, where, where you were last March and what you're looking forward to now and maybe what's happened recently that starts to get, get us back towards what we do. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, fingers crossed, of course. Right. Um, yeah. Well, last March, you know, uh, I had just finished uh, tech week, which is uh, what we in the theater world uh, call uh, final technical production right. uh, rehearsals uh, where you iron out all the f- technical aspects of a, of a show uh, right before you, you get put everything to, to put, put the actors in the scenic uh, to, all together and really do the final level of preparation for performance. Yeah, right, right, before, was fi- right before final dress rehearsals. And right. uh, so we, we had just finished Tech Week and I had got a call from the university uh, as I got home that uh, the university had been closed and 
uh, for, until further notice. This was at, so, at Hofstra, right? This was at Hofstra University right. in Long Island. And so we didn't know exactly uh, what that meant as far as, well, is the show canceled that we put on hiatus? And nobody had any answers, like nobody had mm-hmm. any answers anywhere. And right. uh, so we, you know, we just kept, we crossed our fingers for a month and it eventually became obvious that this is not going to be happening. Uh, so, uh, we had, uh, transferred, we were just going to cancel the show, which was horrible for, you know, the, especially the graduating seniors who, for, I think a handful of them, this was their very first production and only production they had ever been involved with. So and what, what was that production? This was, uh, Tennessee Williams Summer in Smoke. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was actually, I was thrilled with their work up to this point and, uh, it was heartbroken as well, but mm-hmm. it couldn't have been as heartbroken as they were. But, um. Yeah, we, uh, after just closing up shop, as it were, e- eventually I got emails from the students saying they were, uh, this was when a lot of the Broadway productions were just banding together to have these Zoom productions, mm. uh, Zoom performances, I should say, and uh, they wanted to do something like that. So we had reformatted the entire show and within a couple of weeks made a Zoom, uh, live Zoom performance of Tennessee Williams Summer and Smoke. Fortunately, because of the rights that that we had signed with uh, the, the, the producers, uh, the owners of the, of the work, uh, we were not allowed to broadcast it, and we could right. only allow you know like students to actually like a, pri- a private a private thing, yeah. private viewing. So that, that, that was a drag. But uh, you know, actually, I just uh, got off a meeting with some of the people there, and they told me uh, months later it was as if a bomb had gone off because they had gone back in August and they had walked into the theater and like hammers and gloves and uh, rulers and pencils were, everything was in the exact same place they left it after the tech. Uh, so uh, kind of eerie and uh, you know, hopeful, I suppose, because now we're looking forward to, uh, you know, hopefully having a production in the fall we're in uh, production meetings at least and planning and we've cast a show and uh, fingers crossed everything happens as well out there that's great well I, I'm, it's great to hear that y'all were able to, to do something at least with what with the show that got sort, sort of frozen in amber and yes. that things are beginning to come back out there on the island and and I'm sure we'll, we're going to talk about at least one of your other productions um, going forward. But for now, it's great to talk to you, Rod. And um, thanks for coming on. And we will now go back to Act Two of Albert Herring by Benjamin Britten.
live it up with what chatter in our turn tonight, so us who won't matter. <laughs>
Give me a clear cut case of us. 
house in late last night. Where exactly did you go? Slipped through the streets and out of sight. Were you alone? Say yes or no. Yes. Did you remain alone for long? You met some friends.